Chapter 5 It was bizarre attending his own funeral. Being the kind of pathetic loser he'd always been, Paul had imagined what it might be like many times. Each time he'd pictured a small, a pathetic loser, yes, but a realist, crowd of family and so-called friends, all torn apart with guilt and shame because they'd failed him, never understood him, been horrible to him, and now it was too late to set things right. He pictured them over and over again, heads bowed as they stood in the rain beside his open grave. Obviously, it'd have to be raining, looking down at their shoes, miserable and wet, while his disembodied spirit floated above the treetops, sticking out its ectoplasmic tongue at them. It had always been a strangely comforting fantasy, which was why he'd kept coming back to it. Instead, people keep staring at me. He hissed at Mr. Lairtides as they filed out of the crematorium into the painfully bright sunlight. They, they know it's me. I'm going to be in so much trouble. Balls, Mr. Lairtides replied, without any visible lip movement. None of them have ever seen you before, and they're all wondering who you are. Probably they think you're my boyfriend. What? what, what at my own funeral? That, that's so... Keep your voice down, Mr. Lairtides growled. Who's that large woman with luminous hair? Her, over there, just ducked behind the laurel bushes for a smoke. Who? Oh, oh, that's my mother. Paul frowned. His shoes were too tight for his new feet. It, it was nice of her to come, though, all the way from Florida. Pity Dad couldn't make it. But apparently he's in some posh golf tournament. And the quarterfinals are tomorrow. Bastard, he added. You should go and talk to her, Mr. Lairtide said. Offer her your sympathy at her sad loss. Who's that girl standing on her own at the back? Ex-girlfriend, by the look of her. Paul was about to point out that Sophie hadn't come when he realised who Mr. Lairtides had meant. That? Uh, Mr. Tanner's mother, you know, from the office. Are you sure? Doesn't look like her. No claws or fangs, for one thing. She's in disguise. Well, not disguise exactly. She likes to dress up as humans. Mr. Lairtides shrugged. Whatever. In any event, she's adding a bit of tone to the proceedings. Call no man's life wasted, I always say, when there's a mysterious, beautiful girl in floods of tears at his funeral. Paul shook his head. That's not floods of tears, he said. She's probably just picking her nose behind a handkerchief. Floods of tears, Mr. Lairtides repeated firmly. Though since it was her that had you killed, it may just be a show she's putting on for the lawyers, in case your family decides to sue. Paul shook his head as his seven-year-old cousin Penny ran past chasing a pigeon. No dice, he said. They went to see a lawyer in Orlando as soon as they heard what happened. Apparently they lost all their rights to compensation when they sold me to JWW. <laughs> you lot could sue, the firm, I mean, but I don't suppose Mr Tanner would be too happy about suing his own mother. <laughs> Mr Lairtides grinned just a little. Dennis Tanner is incapable of happiness, he replied. It just sort of soaks away into him like water in the desert. Are any of your friends here? Dave and Chloe said they'd try and look in for the reception, <laughs> Paul replied. Howard sent my mum a nice card with lilies on it. He looked away. Actually, it was a birthday card, but he gummed a bit of white paper over the inscription. <laughs> Touching. <sighs> Mr Lairtides yawned. I wonder what's taking so long, he said. You didn't have any metal bits inside you, did you? You know, hip replacements, pacemakers, stuff like that. Paul thought for a moment. Tooth fillings? He said. That's about it. Uh, talking of which, who the hell decided on cremation? I've always thought it's a bit, you know, yucky. Better than being eaten by worms, surely. I expect it was your mother, was next of kin. Well, she might have asked me first. Look, look, they're coming out. Paul pulled a face. I, I suppose that's me there in that little box thing. I didn't know the procedure at these things. I mean, what happens next? Depends. Twelve, by the way. Twelve what? People here. Mourners, I counted. That's not including us, of course, even so. Fourteen, Paul said defiantly. A and there'd have been more if it wasn't for the football. England versus Kiribati. <laughs> Mr. Lairtides dipped his head. I know, he said. There was someone sitting behind us during the service, listening on headphones. <laughs> we were six nil down at half time, if you're interested. Y you're right, Paul said quietly. It's absolutely bloody ghastly. I shouldn't have come. It's so. He shrugged. Twelve people, he said. Not much to show for a life, is it? Never mind, Mr. Lairtides said. You'll just have to do better next time. Shouldn't be difficult, he added. One dozen to beat. It'll give you something to work towards. 
Paul frowned. His mother was trying to get the lid off the little box. Either she was going to scatter him in the Garden of Remembrance or use him as an ash tree. The lid popped off unexpectedly. Fine wisps of grey powder went everywhere and his mum sneezed. <sighs> Figures, Paul said. When I was alive, she always said I got right up her nose sometimes. I'm pleased to see dying hasn't changed that. It's good that you can make jokes about it, Mr Laird, I had said indulgently. In case you're wondering, by the way, what's inside that little box is the ashes of 200 copies of the Financial Times, glamorised to pass for your mortal remains. <laughs> A suitably ephemeral note, I thought. So have you seen enough already, or are you dead set on hanging on for the reception? Paul shrugged his shoulders. Thanks to the strong magic he'd learned over the last few days, he had something to shrug with for a change. Let's go he said. I get the general idea. He turned his back on them and headed for the car park. So far, he had to admit, the great makeover of his existence hadn't gone precisely as he'd hoped. The biggest disappointment, of course, was that Sophie hadn't bothered to show up, but probably that was for the best too. Either she'd have been genuinely upset, which would have made him feel bad, or she wouldn't, which would have been worse. Maybe she couldn't get the time off work, he told himself. That'll be JWW all over. Only twelve, though. That wasn't good. Even Uncle Ken was missing, he noticed. Uncle Ken had always remembered Paul's birthday, but apparently couldn't be bothered to make an effort for his death. It was enough to make him wish he'd made a will so he could have left nothing to any of them, except that there hadn't been anything to leave apart from dirty laundry, in court washing up, and a few tins of baked beans. I'll miss the flat, though, he said aloud. What's going to happen to all my stuff? Sold, Mr Laertides replied. The whole lot will just about fetch enough to pay off the outstanding week's rent, he grinned. Don't worry, I've seen to it. A friend of mine does house clearances. He bought the lot, and you can owe it to me until you start to work again and get your first paycheck. While we're on the subject, I went and saw your landlord. Said my nephew was moving to London, and I heard there was a flat going. My friend's got all your stuff in cardboard boxes at his lock-up, and he'll put it back this afternoon. All right. Uh, oh, Paul said. Uh, thanks, he added. I mean, it's only junk, but... He didn't finish the sentence. He didn't want to have to say that everything in his life had amounted to was in there. So little of it, so worthless. Just things. But it was all he'd got. Thanks, he repeated. You've been to a lot of trouble. It was my idea, Mr Laertides replied. It's up to me to keep the inconvenience down to a minimum. Now, I don't know about you, but I could do with some lunch, he yawned. Ricky Wormtoter didn't make it down, I noticed. I thought you and he got along all right. You saved his life or something. Paul shook his head. Not really, he said. I helped him get shot of Countess Judy, but that didn't make us best buddies. <laughs> Besides, he was probably off on a business and uh, couldn't get away. Mr. Laertides got in the car. He had a huge, open, green Bentley, conspicuous as an exploding gas main. She wasn't there either, he said. You're upset about that, I can see. Maybe she just couldn't face it. it yeah, right. Paul didn't want to talk about that. It, it doesn't matter, he said. I couldn't care less, actually. I'd have missed my CD collection, but I can do without Sophie Pettingill, or any of them, he added with a shrug. Which is just as well, really. <laughs> That's the spirit. What we need, Mr. Laertide said, starting the engine, is comfort food, which boils down to a simple choice, pizza or pie and chips. Your choice? P pizza, Paul replied. Tea, he added. Decisive. I'm improving, <laughs> aren't I? Bloody bold and resolute, Mr. Laertides replied gravely. I ought to point out that I detest pizza and gives me wind, but this is your special day, my treat, he added. Paul looked round at him and thought, why is he doing this for the 75th time that day? He knew the answer in general terms, of course. Mr. Lettides wanted something from him, something only he could do or get or be in connection with some JWW type scheme. There would be a great deal of money in it for him, none of which was likely to come Paul's way. It would almost certainly end in tears, and only a complete and utter idiot would have got involved with it in the first place. On the other hand, he happened to catch a glimpse of his new face and wing mirror of Mr. Lettides' beautiful car. That's me, he thought in wonder. And since everything he'd ever done had always gone wrong anyway, and man is born to sorrow as the toast falls buttered tied down, why the hell not? So that's you fixed up, Mr. Laertides was saying. You've got somewhere to live, a job to go to in the morning, and you look the way a Hollywood star thinks he looks when he checks himself out in the mirror. He paused, stamping down on the accelerator to overtake a milk float. All you need now, he said, is a name. 
Philip Marlowe, Paul said, smiling. Mr Tanner should be expecting me. I'm the new assistant. <laughs> the woman behind the desk scowled at him through her half-inch thick glasses. I'll let him know you're here, she said. Take a seat. He won't be long. Nor gorgeous blonde, sultry redhead, stunning brunette, or lotus-eyed oriental beauty on reception today. Instead, a massive fifty-something with hair like steel wool stretched back in a bun and a wart on her chin. It took Paul fifteen seconds to figure out that this was Mr Tanner's mum's equivalent of full mourning. He was touched, but obviously couldn't show it. He nodded politely, sat down and picked up a two-year-old colour supplement from the pile on the table. Philip Marlowe hadn't been his idea... Not really. All through lunch he'd dithered, rejecting Mr Laertides' suggestions and making none of his own, until Mr Laertides had asked him, in an apparent change of subject, if he liked all black and white thrillers. He'd been unwise enough to say yes, he didn't mind them occasionally, and now here he was. At least it ought to be easy to remember. Mr Tanner's ready for you now, said Mr Tanner's mum. He thanked her and set off towards the fire door that separated the front office from the rest of the building, only remembering, as his hand made contact with the handle, that he wasn't supposed to know the way. Uh, "'Can you tell me?' he began. Mr Tanner's mum nodded and reeled off a set of directions which would, he reckoned, leave him stranded in the third-floor lady's toilet. "'Got that?' she said. Paul nodded. "'I'll find it,' he said, and set off up the stairs without looking back things he couldn't help thinking was starting to look up already. For the first time since he joined the firm, he hadn't had the embarrassment of fighting off Mr Tanner's mum's extra goblin brand of mild flirtation as he ran the gauntlet of the front office. He'd been a bit worried about that. She'd fancied him rotten when he was Paul the mess carpenter. Given her readily admitted weakness for cute humans, Paul had wondered how the hell Philip Marlowe was going to get out of reception with the shred of clothing left on him. Apparently, though, she wasn't in the mood this morning. A blessing, Paul decided, as long as it lasted. A minute or so later, he was knocking on Mr Tanner's door. The first time he'd been in this room, he remembered, as he picked his way across the file-strewn floor between the door and the desk, the general ambience of intimidating weirdness had struck him incoherent, and he'd gawped and gabbled like a clown with toothache. Now, being used to it all, he could move through the cigar smoke fog and under the rows of neatly mounted razor edged tomahawks that lined every wall without a second look. If he didn't know better, he'd have believed that Mr Tanner was impressed by such a display of insolence, because instead of scowling at him and grunting, Mr Tanner stood up and held out his hand like a real human being. Dennis Tanner, he said, commodities and mineral rights. Can I offer you a cup of coffee? Thanks, Paul replied and sat down. Of course, he now knew all about Mr Tanner's office chair and lowered himself into it carefully and with a precision. Don't let it sense you're afraid of it, Benny Shumway had advised him once. Be afraid of it by all means, just don't let it know. While he did this, Mr Tanner buzzed for Christine and placed the coffee order. Well, Mr Tanner went on, looking at him warily through his round, practically lidless eyes. Frank Leotard seems to think very highly of you. One of the many things that Philip Marlowe could do and Paul Carpenter couldn't was fluent body language. A very slight dip of the head put across exactly the right blend of familiarity and respect. I've been lucky enough to work with him before, as you know, Paul said. He reckons we make a good team. A faint flicker of a deprecating smile. God, Paul couldn't help thinking. Communication was really piss easy when you didn't have to blunder about using stupid old words. If Frank wants you on board, that's good enough for us, Mr Tanner was saying in a tone of voice Paul had never heard before. Practically ingratiating, almost as though Mr Tanner was glad he was here. A strange and sudden thought struck him. This was what it felt like, he realised, to get off on the right foot, make a good first impression. It was a stroke of luck you being available at precisely this moment, Mr Tanner went on, since we've suddenly found ourselves short-staffed. Don't know if Frank's filled you in on the background, or... Paul nodded, and Mr Tanner relaxed a little, clearly grateful not to have to go through a long and dreary story. I'm hoping you don't mind jumping right in at the deep end. It'd be great help to all of us if you could see your way to starting right away. Though if that's not convenient... No problem, Paul said, confident, decisive, short and to the point. Everything Paul Carpenter had never been. Why, why the fuck did a slight rearrangement of his facial geography make such a vast difference? I have a feeling that it won't take me very long at all to get settled in here. If I may say so, Mr Tanner, you run a tight ship. What did that mean exactly? A ship that never bought around? A ship that kept getting wedged in the entrances to small harbours? 
We do our best, Mr. Tanner replied, and Paul could actually see him swelling, frog-like, just a tiny bit. We try and make it a happy ship too, of course. We always fail, and that just sort of comes along once you've got everything running as smoothly as you can. Anyhow, he went on, according to Frank, you know the work inside out. Anything else you want any help with? Just give me a shout and we'll get you fixed up in no time. Meanwhile, all I've got left to say is welcome aboard. So much maritime imagery. Paul wouldn't have been surprised if Mr Tanner had hopped up onto his desk and started dancing a hornpipe. And the hypocrisy of it all? Run a tight ship indeed. Paul Carpenter could never have got away with any of that kind of twaddle in a million years. Was it really just because his nose was a bit straighter, his ears a tad less elephantine? Not that it mattered. He'd read somewhere that scientists had conclusively proved that the difference between drop-dead gorgeous and back-end of a bus ugly was usually no more than twenty-five thousandths of an inch. He surfaced from his reflections in time to hear Mr Tanner buzzing someone else. I've asked Vicky to join us, he was saying. She'll show you round, tell you where everything is. She'll be doing your general typing and filing. We've only just promoted her out of the typing pool, but she seems like a bright enough girl. Dear God, Paul thought, they're giving me a secretary. Somehow it struck him as bizarre, faintly barbaric, like an arranged marriage or sacrificing a chicken to the gods. But that'll mean giving orders, telling someone what to do. I can't do that. Correction, Paul Carpenter couldn't have done that, but Paul's not here any more, is he? And if there's anything you need help with, Mr Tanner was saying, there's always Sophie Pettingill, the junior clerk. Mr Tanner paused, frowned. Her manner takes a bit of getting used to, he went on, as though he was trying to sell Paul a semi-derelict second-hand car. But she's a good little worker when she sets her mind to it. Paul felt his right hand clench into a fist, but no... Bashing Mr Tanner's face in wouldn't be a good idea, not even for popular, likeable Phil Marlowe. Besides, he reminded himself, this is Mr Tanner. You know he's an arsehole, so what do you expect? A fundamental rule of life had just, he realised, become relevant to him for the first time ever. Just because someone likes you, it's not obligatory to like them back. Uh, sorry, Paul said. What was that name again? Sophie Pettingill. Mr Tanner repeated. I expect you'll run into her sooner or later. At the moment she's been drafted in to work with Theo Van Spee. Pause. And Mr Tanner looked at him. You don't need me to explain why, his expression was saying, gratefully. Clearly the death of Paul Carpenter was something nobody wanted to talk about. Fine by me, Paul thought. A knock at the door. Paul had his back to it. And so he heard the voice before he saw the face. By then Mr Tanner was doing introductions. Vicky, this is Philip Marlowe, who you're going to be working with, she said how nice, or words to that effect. He knew her voice instantly, which was probably just as well. He wasn't sure he'd have recognised her without her tail. Hello, she said, and smiled. And Paul thought, thank God for Mr Laertides and the medicine without which. Actually, he'd been completely wrong about one thing. He'd have recognised her straight away in any context because of that hair. Bright, soft auburn with gold streaks, so light they could almost be silver. Only just promoted her out of the typing pool, Mr Tanner had said. That should have put him on notice, only he hadn't been paying attention. Must stop that. Too slack, too Paul Carpenter. Talking of which, he did a quick systems analysis, hoping he wasn't being too obvious about it, and was vastly relieved to find that despite the hair and the voice and the smile, the medicine did appear to be working. Pleased to meet you, he said brightly. Next half an hour was awkward to say the least. Vicky led him down the corridors and up the stairs into offices and interview rooms and closed file stores and kitchens. It was all completely familiar, of course, but also somehow strange. Not because it had changed, but because he had. It was as though Robinson Crusoe had returned to his island incognito on a package tour and the guide had shown him his cave, his lookout, the beach where he'd seen the footprint. And this is the junior clerk's office, she was saying, as she knocked on the door and Sophie's voice, typically petulant, called out, Come in! She was sitting at the desk and all Paul could see of her was the crown of her head, poking out over the top of a huge mound of Mortensen printouts. Then she disappeared completely for a moment and emerged a second late around the side of the great pile. Her eyes had the dead look of the long-term paper shuffler, and she looked at them both blankly without saying anything. 
This is Philip Marlowe, Vicky said, her cheerful tone faltering slightly in the face of Sophie's vacant stare. He's joined us as Mr Lairtide's assistant. Phil, at what point he had become Phil? Not that he minded, he just couldn't remember. This is Sophie Pettingill, the junior clerk. Hi, Sophie said, which was odd. Sophie didn't say hi in roughly the same way that she didn't run singing through meadows full of spring flowers while wearing floral print dresses, nor did she smile at people she'd never met before. For a split second he assumed that she was pleased to see Vicky, but apparently not. In fact, if she'd registered Vicky's existence at all, it could only have been for an instant and then she dismissed it as irrelevant and unnecessary, possibly even unwelcome. Nor, she was smiling at him and saying hi and... Blushing? Water doesn't flow uphill, the sun doesn't rise in the west, lead weights don't hover in mid-air when you drop them, and Sophie Pettingill never, ever blushed. It was just one of those things, a given. Scotty looking sad and mourning, I cannot change the laws of physics, Captain. But her dark eyes were wide, and she was looking at him the way he fumbled around in his memory and found what he was searching for. She was looking at him the way Paul Carpenter used to look at girls, at least until they noticed and asked him not to. The same Paul Carpenter would have said, um, at this point, or something equally brilliant, but he was in his little box now, ashes to ashes. My God, Paul said, you look busy, is it always as bad as this around here? Sophie laughed, or rather simpered, and E announced that it had enough of equalling MC squared and was planning to start a new life in Patagonia with the square on the hypotenuse. Not usually, she said, but it's been really, like, hectic since Paul, he was the other junior clerk, but he... She stopped dead and shook herself like a wet dog. It's just me now, and so I've got to do all the work and his work as well. That's awful, Paul said, and she nodded three times very quickly. It's not so bad, she said bravely. So you're working with Mr Lairtides then? That's right. I haven't actually met him yet myself, Sophie said, but I'm really, really interested in that side of the business. She hesitated, and in one of those rare, brief flashes of insight that you get sometimes when you least expect them, Paul realised that she didn't actually know what Mr Lairtides did. So maybe... It's a fascinating area, media and public relations, Paul said rapidly, and Frank's quite possibly the best there is, so if you do get a chance to sit in with us, you couldn't hope for a better start. He smiled encouragingly, just in case there was the slightest possible ambiguity, and a sort of stuffed expression covered Sophie's face, one which was immediately familiar to Paul from a long succession of mirrors. So, he said, who are you with right now? Oh, nobody, she said very quickly. Then she blinked twice. He could almost hear the sucking sound of the mental foot being extracted and said, I mean, I'm doing three months with Professor Van Spee. He's applied sorcery and stuff, but I've only got a few more weeks to go. A tongue ferociously clicked a few feet to Paul's left and made him break eye contact. Vicky was still smiling in a non-specific manner, like a water cannon blasting an unruly mob, but there was a hard edge to her expression that you could have sharpened knives on. Actually, she was saying, we've still got a lot to see, so maybe, she tailed off, suddenly aware that she didn't have the sympathy of her audience. We ought to be getting on, she added firmly. Really? Oh, right, Paul said. Well, it was nice meeting you, and I expect we'll be seeing more of each other quite soon. Sophie nodded enthusiastically, like a seal watching the piece of fish in its trainer's hand. Best of luck with the Mortensons, he added. I don't envy you that job. Oh, someone's got to do it, <laughs> Sophie replied cheerfully. See you soon. I mean, bye. He could feel her eyes watching him all the way out of the door. There was a slight edge to Vicky's manner as they finished off the tour, but Paul was too preoccupied to worry about it, or even to reflect in general terms about what Vicky was doing. On two legs, out of the typing pool. He felt like someone who's just been told something in a foreign language that only knows a few words of, and it's either that or he's won a million dollars on a lottery, or else he's under arrest for espionage and due to be shot at dawn, or possibly both. He'd shared his own sad company for enough years to recognise the symptoms. The lemming-like rush over the cliffs of at first sight. The difference was that hitherto he had always been the lemming, not the cliff. But there was no other way to account for Sophie's extraordinary behaviour, and if he was right, then that was absolutely wonderful. Or, looked at from a slightly different perspective, a total disaster.
This is Mr. Worm Titus' office, Vicky was saying, and either she was still royally ticked off about something, or she didn't like Ricky Worm Tortler very much. But apparently he's not in. Never mind. I expect you'll learn into him sooner or later. Mr. Worm Toter kills things for a living, she added. Dragons and stuff. Now, just down here on the left... Yes, I know, you silly cow. That's a stationary cupboard where Julie hoards the pads of yellow stickies. Shut up while I'm introspecting for crying out loud. A total and utter fucking disaster because it looks horribly as though Sophie's just fallen head over heels with someone and it's not me. At least it is me, but... And that's about it, Vicky was babbling. Apart from Mr. Laertide's room, of course, and your office, which is right next to it, just down the passage here on your right, and... Paul stopped and looked at her. She looked back, and deep in her soft brown eyes he saw something he couldn't quite place, but which made him take a step back, as though he'd just blundered in on a fight to the death between two strangers. "'Thanks for the tour,' he said, that old Phil Marlowe charm still running on autopilot, when what he really wanted to say was, "'Who are you?' or maybe just, "'I think I'd better go and let Frank know I'm here. It's been... Even suave, unflappable Phil couldn't quite put into words what it had been, except that in spite of the strange new experiences, Mr. Tanner being polite, Sophie practically drooling down his shirt front, Mr. Tanner's mum not drooling down his shirt front, and other wonders too bizarre to be comfortably contained in his mind, in spite of all that, it was still very much business as usual at 70 St. Mary Axe, and that was both reassuring and definitely, infinitely depressing. Looking in the mirror and seeing drop dead gorgeous, or in his case, having drop dead gorgeous, which amounted to much the same thing, was all very well, but it was still an unsolicited free gift from a partner in the firm. Beautifully gift wrapped, and if he held it to his ear, audibly ticking. What on earth possessed me to do it? he asked himself, not for the first time. And he knocked on Mr. Laertide's door and went in quickly before his subconscious could provide him with an uncomfortable answer. "'There you are,' said Mr. Laertides. "'He was sitting in front of the window, back to the door, looking out over the street. "'Well, how did it go?' "'Odd,' Paul replied. "'Mr. Tanner was, well, civil. "'It's amazing what people can do when they really try. "'How about Ricky?' "'Out.' "'Mr. Laertides shrugged. "'I honestly don't think there's any danger of him recognising you, "'or any of the others come to that. "'Did you go to see Theo?' Paul shook his head and then realised that Mr. Laertines was facing the other way. Apparently, though, that didn't matter because he said, Probably wise. Who else? Castle Many shall we? What the hell, Paul thought, and nodded. And, um, Sophie, she was... Rude, brusque, gauche. Mr. Laertines laughed. She's a caution, that Sophie, but she doesn't... Actually, Paul said, and why the hell should he tell Mr. Laertides, or why should he care? But anyhow, actually, she was quite friendly. Oh, Mr. Laertides turned round slowly and looked at him. That's interesting. So what happened? You knocked and went in and Paul nodded. And Vicky said, this is Philip Marlowe. He's the new... Hang on. Mr. Laertides' eyes had suddenly grown very small and bright. Who's Vicky? Vicky the mermaid. Well, she's got legs now. Yes, indeed. And they've made her my secretary. Tall girl, brown hair with shiny bits, used to be in the typing pool. Mr. Laertides frowned. Parts of his face gathered together like a herd of migratory animals around a waterhole. Vicky, he repeated. I don't think I've come across her. Anyway, not to worry. His face opened again, and he looked almost mischievous, like a small boy watching the door he's just balanced a bag of flour on. What was it like? Different? You could say that, Paul mumbled. It may take some getting used to. People liking me, he added, for no reason. Mr. Laertides laughed. A barrel-chested, curly-bearded Pirate King laugh that it shouldn't have been possible to dredge out of his stick-insect body. There you are, you see, he said. For no reason. That's your basic problem. You go through life believing you don't deserve to be liked, and that's what caused a lifetime of misery for you and a lot of other people. The last part left a barb in Paul's attention. Uh, other people? Of course. Your parents, your family. You don't suppose that on the day you were born, the whole lot of them crowded round you, sniffed and made a decision that you were no good? Of course not. It was mostly you, gradually, over the years. If your parents made the decision to sell you to JWW, it wasn't just because they're unspeakable bastards. Partly it's that, of course. But you must have helped. Thank you, said Paul. Thank you so much. Mr. Laertide shrugged. 
He was a great shrugger. Not that it matters any more, he said. They're in Florida. You need never have anything to do with them any more. And everybody thinks you're dead. Now you've got a chance to be whatever you want. The key to not screwing up this time is knowing what you want. Simple as that. Fine, Paul said. And I suppose you know what that is. Of course I do. It's not like you're a particularly complicated character. You just want true love. I could point out to you how shallow and incredibly self-limiting this is. It's as though I'm asking a six-year-old kid what she wants most of all in the whole world for her birthday, and she tells me she wants to be seven. I could suggest a long list of better things to want, and I could probably make you realise how much more useful and beneficial they'd be. I could take you out to be a great many very unhappy people who found true love but not, for example, money or health or freedom, but... He made a wide gesture with his hands. That's none of my business. If you really want two pairs of socks for Christmas, that's what you'll get. Anyhow, I've fulfilled my side of the bargain. Click, Paul thought. The sound of the piece is falling into place. Bargain, he repeated. Bargain, yes. I'm a businessman, not a charity. But you said if I helped you with what you were doing at the party convention. Mr. Lertide shook his head. You don't believe that. You know the score. You're perfectly aware of what I was offering, what the price would be. The straight traditional barter, a body for a soul. Where I do business, innovation is frowned upon. Paul looked at him for a while. He didn't move. Not a flicker. My soul, he said. Correct. What's that mean exactly? Ah, well, Mr. Lertide smiled pleasantly. That's a matter of personal belief, isn't it? Though in your case, you have an advantage over most people. You know where we go when we die. Those aren't souls, Paul said straight away, without needing to think. They're just, well, leftovers, scraps. You don't want anything like that. Right again. What I want is something completely different. And the good part is, I'm guaranteed delivery. Mr. Lertide shrugged again. It's your choice, he said. But so long as you wear that face, you're carrying out your side of the deal. That's all I'm saying. Now, he went on, I think it's time we got some work done, don't you? No, I don't, Paul blurted out. I want you to tell me exactly what the hell you mean by all that stuff. No, Mr. Lertide's face had set, still as a photograph. I can't do that. Sorry, you're just going to have to take my word for this, but if I tell you what you want to know, it buggers up the whole thing. Don't interrupt, he added, as Paul found that he couldn't, even if he wanted to. He had no words, nor voice to say them with. I need your help, Miss Lertides went on. You and nobody else but you. The job I have to do is very important to me, and it's also my business and no one else's. Meanwhile, you've been very generously paid for your involvement, an unbreakable heart and a sublime gift of beauty. Cheer up for crying out loud. You've got the fifth and sixth ace in life's poker game. What else could you possibly want or need come to that? Cheer up, Paul said. Why would I want to do that? Mr. Lertise stood up slowly and walked towards him, making no noise, hardly disturbing the air. I could make you be cheerful, he said. I could make you be happy. I could make it so that every day of your life is filled with sunshine and joy, whether you like it or not. All I have to do is decide. I don't even need to say the magic words or snap my fingers, but out of the infinite kindness of my heart, and because, for some bizarre reason I can't fathom, I like you, I'm not going to do that to you, not if you stop mucking me about and do as you're told. Do you understand me? No, Paul thought, because you're talking drivel. But before he could do or see anything, a memory flashed through his mind. He remembered Sophie offering to drink the love filter. Even now there were times when he cursed himself for being so stupid as to refuse. But he knew that if she had done it, even being in the same room with her would have been unbearable. Because of the magnitude, the sheer horror of the lie. And suppose Mr. Lertides could make good on his threat. Perfect happiness and contentment forever, no matter what. Wouldn't that be infinitely worse? For a moment, Paul felt like he was going to be sick. He shut his eyes, and when he opened them again, there was Mr. Lertides offering him a glass of water. Sorry, he said. I didn't want to have to upset you like that, but you're going to have to trust me, that's all. Paul sipped the water and pulled himself together. If you say so, he said. I do say so. And now, Mr. Lertide sat down in his chair, stuck out his feet, put his hands behind his head. Let's clear the air and take our minds off all this unpleasantness by doing a little bit of actual paid work for a change. Someone's got to bring in the pennies, you know. There's nothing I can do, Paul thought. I've walked into something nasty and I can't get out. I don't even know what it is. And the one constant in an infinitely changing universe, there's 
bugger all I can do about it. Mr. Lairtides looked up. Well? Sure, Paul said. What do you want me to do? Working for Mr. Lairtides was rather different from what Paul had become used to over the last nine months. Hitherto, to be sure, most of the time he hadn't understood what he was doing, or known what it was for, or how the partners translated it into money. But at least it felt a reassuringly like work. Work isn't hard to recognise. It's boring, difficult, the antithesis of fun, because if it wasn't, it wouldn't be work at all. The universe is built up of polarities. It deals in such opposites as day and night, light and dark, good and evil, dead and life, false and real, work and fun. Everything that isn't one is the other. The categories are separate and exclusive. If it's fun, it can't be work and vice versa. But the tasks he had to perform for Mr. Lertides, although hardly fun, didn't have that gritty, dry work texture about them. They were neither one thing nor the other. A third category, a hitherto undiscovered element, a pocket dimension. Paul's first job had been to think of a flower. He had to sit still, I should, hands on the arms of the chair, and think of a flower. It could be any shape or colour he liked. It didn't have to be a real flower. It could be completely imaginary, just so long as it was a flower. Screw this, Paul thought, and sat still and quiet for a moment before saying, Right, done that. But Mr Lairtide said, No, you haven't, in a grim voice. So Paul admitted defeat and thought of a geranium. At least he thought it was a geranium, but it could just as easily have been a dahlia or a chrysanthemum. Paul knew very little about flowers and cared less. Excellent, he heard Mr. Lairtide say. Although if we're going to be annoyingly pedantic about things, that's actually a foxglove. Doesn't matter though, and you're doing just fine. Now, you can open your eyes, and by the way, I'd like you to describe for me the taste of an onion. Paul sat up. You what? You heard me. Imagine I've never eaten an onion. What do they taste like? Paul frowned. No offence, he said, but how exactly is this paying work? I thought you, well, sort of wrote speeches for people and worked out what their colours are and stuff. That's right, said Mr Lairtides, up to a point, and that's why I need you to tell me what an onion tastes like. Fine, Paul thought, just checking. Well, he said, it, it's sort of sharp and sour and a bit yuck, really, but it's also crunchy and a bit refreshing. That's when it's raw, of course. Cooked? No, that's fine. Mr. Lairtide stopped him with a wave of his hand. That's exactly what I needed. Thank you. Now, would you mind telling me about the sexiest pair of wrists you ever saw? Paul just looked at him for a moment. Wrists, he said. Wrists, repeated Mr. Lairtides, with a hint of impatience. You know, the bit that joins the hands to the arms. Come on, you've spent your entire adult life gobbing at girls. What constitutes a really cute wrist? After a long, long silence, Paul said, a Absence of thick, curly hair is all that springs to mind. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. You're doing really well, I promise you. Now, I suggest you have lunch early, because this afternoon I need you to nip down to Swindon and look at a tree. Saw so Paul nipped. The tree was exactly where Mr Lairtide said it would be, on the corner of Dunkswell Street and Arundel Drive. It was slightly shorter than the other eleven trees in the row, and local government had splurged on a stake for it to lean on, but not the little strap to tie it there too. Look at it, Mr Lairtides had said, and beyond that he'd refused to be drawn. So Paul looked at it, carefully, for five minutes. It's a tree, he eventually decided. So fucking what? And then he went home. It was about eight feet tall, he started to say, first thing next morning. Sort of greenish leaves. I, I, I don't... But Mr Lairtides held up his hand as though conducting traffic. I said, look at it, he said. I don't need a description. Well done, though. We're making good progress so far. Which reminds me, here's a fiver. Just pop down to Aldgate and buy me a toothbrush. It was five minutes past nine. Way, way too early in the morning for that sort of thing. Aldgate, Paul said. But that's half an hour walk. And there's a boots just round the Aldgate, Mr Lairtides insisted. It's got to be Aldgate. Oh, all right. Blue, if there's a choice. If not, whatever they've got. Take a cab. The firm's paying. 
So Paul took a taxi to Aldgate and spent half an hour traipsing up and down, looking in vain for a shop that sold toothbrushes. Anything else, apparently, he could have had his pick of, from microchips to elephants. If he wanted a toothbrush, however, the consensus was that he should nip around the corner, a hundred yards or so, to the chemist in the arcade, where they'd be overjoyed to sell him the toothbrush of his dreams. He thanked them all, said he'd do that, and carried on down the street to the next remote possibility. He was just about to pack it in and go back when he saw a little tiny shop shoehorned in between an airline and a bookstore. Demetrius Paleologus, established 1954. Antiques, rare books, prints, maps, vintage scientific instruments, toothbrushes. Mr Paleologus saw his duly appointed representative was a short, cheerful-looking man with a completely spherical bald head, round glasses and chins like a concertina. The face and shape were more than a little familiar, something to do with coffee and cake, but Paul couldn't quite place it. Mr Paleologus had a toothbrush for sale, he even had a blue toothbrush, though he admitted that he couldn't personally endorse that particular model, whereas the green one with the textured handle... no. The blue one, then. Fine. And you'd like the gift, Rabbed, the man said, a statement, not a question. Well, not really, Paul said. But the man wasn't there any more. He darted into the back room, taking the toothbrush, and Mr Laertides' fiver with him. Paul settled down to wait. There wasn't a great deal in the shop to interest him, apart from the toothbrushes, distinctly separate in the perspex display of their very own on the far wall. It was just a few bits of tatty old furniture, some framed maps and a shelf of big, fat, leather-bound books. After ten minutes of standing around, Paul pulled out one of the books and glanced at it. But the title page was in Latin, and the rest of it was just a load of old-fashioned maps of apparently Nova Scotia, with a few line drawings of fallen-down old castles and the like. Eventually the man came out holding a parcel the size of a shoebox covered in bright red paper and festooned with curly ribbon. Biting back the truth, Paul thanked him, said it was very nice, and left quickly. There were no taxis to be had, so he went back to the office on the bus. People stared at him all the way. This is stupid, he complained, dumping the loathsome parcel down on Mr Laertides' desk. All right, the flower stuff was harmless, and it wasn't bad getting out of the office to look at that tree, but... Get a grip, Mr Laertides said. Just imagine, it could have been pink. <laughs> it's not far off pink, Paul maintained bitterly. Well... "'Aren't you going to open the bloody thing after I've been to all that trouble?' "'Mr. Lertide shook his head. "'That's all right,' he said. "'I trust you to know a blue toothbrush when you see one. "'Now, aren't you going to explain?' "'Please,' Paul said hopefully. "'Just a hint or do. "'Sorry, not possible. "'Now I want you to look through that big cardboard box in the corner over there "'and choose the eight CDs you'd least like to be stranded on a desert island with.' "'And so it went on, day after day.' Carefully examine these seven identical steel washers and say which you think is the shiniest. If you could only eat one thing for the rest of your life, which would you choose? Rice pudding or rich tea biscuits? Who do you think looks better in a hat? Robin Cook or Severiano Ballesteros? Imagine a goldfish, a claw hammer, a mountain, a pile of tins of grapefruit, a shoe, dawn over the Nile Delta in February. Yes. If toothache had a colour, would it be red, black or yellow? Go to a suburban road in Dunstable and count the number of blue cars parked on the south-facing curb. Still, it was better than work, and Paul was getting out of the office quite regularly, and nobody seemed to take notice or mind if he dawdled on his way back. The extra money was nice, too, as were the friendly smiles of the partners as he passed them in the corridors, and the general sense of not being a quarry species at a predator's convention. Mr Tanner's mum was back to her normal flamboyant self at the front desk, but so far she was leaving him well alone. He must have been able to talk to her, but he had other people to chat with now, and besides, he was busy, no time for idle banter. Actually, he realised, the being busy all the time was maybe the greatest improvement of all in his quality of life. Paul Carpenter had been able to shut out the weirdness, and even turn a blind eye to much of the sheer horror and fear, but the one thing he'd never figured out how to cope with was the boredom of hours sitting in his office with nothing to do. Popular Phil Marlowe, on the other hand, might spend his working day carrying out one set of unfathomably bizarre orders after another, but at least he was kept occupied, and if the work he was doing seemed pointless, ridiculous and a total waste of time and effort, how was that different from the working lives of millions of his fellow citizens?'
The tasks that Mr Laertide had set him were no more fatuous than the job descriptions of any number of civil servants, local government officers, revenue officials and duly accredited inspectors of this and that. And unlike them, he wasn't doing anybody any harm. So what was there to complain about? Good work, Mr Laertide said enthusiastically as Paul reported back after a morning spent playing Death Throws 2005 on the office computer. Thanks for that. I do believe we're beginning to make some progress at last. Now... Paul shut his eyes, but only for a moment. I want you, Mr Laertides went on, to nip down to Trafalgar Square and feed the pigeons. Paul looked at him. Sorry? Trafalgar Square, Mr Laertides repeated slowly and clearly. Pigeons. There aren't any, Mr Laertides frowned. How do you mean? There aren't any pigeons in Trafalgar Square these days, Paul said. The government had them all gassed or something. It was on the news at the time. Oh, Mr Laertides shrugged. In that case... I want you to go to St James's Park and feed the ducks. He paused. There are still ducks in St James's Park. I think so. They haven't all been lined up against the wall with little duck-sized blindfolds on or anything. I don't think so. Fine. In that case, here's a kilo and a half of birdseed, he added, pointing to a fat paper bag on the desk. You'll need to take someone with you, give you a hand. Just a moment. Paul objected. Freedom of speech wasn't an issue with Mr. Laertides. He could say pretty much what he liked, raise objections, ask questions, whatever. Of course, his questions weren't answered and his objections were ignored, but it was the principle of the thing. How could feeding the birds, tuppence a bag, possibly need two people? You could take that secretary of yours, Mr. Laertide continued with a grin. Give the poor kid something to do for a change. She must be bored, silly, waiting around for you to give her some typing or filing to do. What did you say her name was again? Paul shook his head. I'd rather not, thanks, he said. Look, is it extremely heavy birthed seat or something? Or does one of us chuck it around while the other one takes notes? Or, Mr. Laertide said, his face suddenly blank, you could ask her to help you. Sophie's name hadn't been mentioned in Mr. Laertide's room before, but even so, there was no need to ask who her was. Paul opened his mouth to refuse and then shut it again. And it'll take you a while, Mr. Laertide's went on, and there's no point you both trudging back to the office at one o'clock and then back again at five past two, so you might as well have lunch out somewhere together, he added. Whenever Mr. Laertides dropped hints, it made Paul think of some US Air Force bunker a mile under the roots of the Rocky Mountains and frantic missile technicians trying to shoot the hint down with tactical nukes before it collided with Earth and started a new ice age. Nevertheless, he hadn't actually seen Sophie to talk to since Phil Marlowe's first day, and a shared cappuccino and sandwich couldn't do any lasting harm. Surely. All right, he said. Should I... Mr. Laertides shook his head. I'll send Theo a memo asking if we can borrow her, he replied. And just then there was a knock at the door and Sophie came in. Paul's first instinct was to look away, but he batted it aside like an over-persistent moth. She paused just inside the room, smiled at him and then handed Mr. Laertides an envelope. He opened it and read the single sheet of paper inside it, smiled and handed it to Paul. From Theodorus Van Spee to Frank Clairtides, you will wish to borrow Ms. Pettingill to help with your current project. I can spare her until 3.45. She will wish to order a banana milkshake, but should be dissuaded from doing so as bananas bring her out in unsightly facial blemishes, a fact which her liking for bananas has led her to ignore. Cordially, TBS. Paul straightjacketed his facial muscles, nodded and handed it back. That seems to be an order, he said, and Mr. Laertides inclined his head gravely. A few minutes later, Paul and Sophie were out in the open air, armed with birdseed and heading for St James's Park in a taxi. So, Paul said after a long silence, during which Sophie had smiled at him at least three times. How's it going? Don't ask. She made a pantomime of rolling her eyes. Honestly, Van Spee can be absolutely bloody insufferable sometimes. Pause, frown. Have you come across him yet? She asked. Tall, thin bloke, quiet beard, cross between Mycroft Holmes and the Wizard of Oz. Paul shook his head. Haven't had that pleasure, he replied. You're in his department, right? Worse luck. Actually, she added, it's not so bad. I mean, there's no goblins or demons or dragons or anything, you know. Yeah. And he doesn't throw tantrums or shout or try and look down the front of my blouse or anything. It's just, uh... Weird, Paul supplied. Weird, she repeated. Absolutely and completely weird. Like yesterday, he had me colouring in a kid's colouring book all afternoon, and we spent three hours this morning playing chess. Really? Who won? 
I did, Soapy replied with a slight frown, which is odd because I'm rubbish and you'd have thought a bloke like that would be brilliant at chess, but no, I beat him six times and drew twice. Go you, Paul said approvingly. But that's not the point, is it? She nodded briskly. Not the point at all. It's weird and it's starting to freak me out. I mean, the filing and the photocopying and looking things up in books and traipsing up and downstairs carrying messages. It was boring and miserable, but at least... She shook her head. If it carries on like this, I'm going to go to Tanner and ask to be transferred. Talking of which, she added, and maybe she'd got something in her eye, do you need any help in your department? Only it's always interested me a lot. Public relations and media and whatever. (laughs) Paul grinned. Actually, he said, I'm not sure you'd want to. For instance, he went on before she could object. Did anyone tell you what we're going to be doing? Well, no, Sophie replied. Van Speed just looked up at me suddenly from the papers we was reading, handed me that envelope, it was there on his desk all morning, ready, and told me to go and see you. Well, you plural, she added in a hurry. So, what exactly are we doing? Feeding the ducks in St James's Park, Paul said. As witness, one paper bag full of birdseed. Feeding the ducks? Why? Paul shrugged. Because he likes birds, or he couldn't think of a reason. Truth is, most of the stuff we do in PR and media is like that. Bizarre and incomprehensible. Sophie paused and looked at him curiously. Bizarre and incomprehensible to the outside observer, she said. But of course you know exactly what it's all in aid of, because it's your speciality, yes? Yes, well, Paul admitted, actually no. Actually, I haven't got a clue. I just do as I'm told, and at the end of the month I get paid money. Presumably there's a point to it all, but... He checked himself. He was sounding a little bit too much like Paul Carpenter back from the dead, and if anyone around J.A.W.W. was likely to notice, it would be Sophie. It's like when they were building the pyramids, or the great cathedrals, he said, smiling cheerfully. Frankly, at Ides is the architect. I just haul on a rope and assume that he knows what he's doing. It's a very complicated branch of the trade, he added grandly. Takes a lifetime to learn, and even then you've got to have the gift or you'll never get anywhere. I see, Sophie replied, and there was a tiny hint of suspicion in her voice. You don't mind that? Not having a clue, I mean? Paul did a rather fine doesn't-bother-me gesture with his hands, completely spontaneous and unrehearsed, too. I go with the flow, he said. Obviously, I pick up bits of theory and stuff as I go along, and once the job's finished, naturally you look at it and think, of course, that's what it was all for. How dumb of me not to figure it out. Oh, Sophie said. Traditional British apprenticeship, in other words. Left-handed screwdrivers and stuff. In a sense, Paul replied, a trifle huffily. I think of it more as being Dr Watson, and you only find out the solution to the case at the end, when Holmes explains it all. I rather like it that way, he added defiantly. At least it keeps it from getting boring. I guess, Sophie said, and then the suspicion and scepticism seemed to drain out of her, like oil from the crankiest of a British motorbike, and Paul could have sworn that she almost sort of batted her eyelashes. Now it was his turn to be suspicious. The Sophie he'd known would rather have been staked out over an anthill in the desert than knowingly have battered an eyelash. Mr Tanner's mum, now in her day, she'd have left no eyelash unbattered and had moistened her lips with the tip of her tongue so often it was a wonder she hadn't had permanent cold sores. But they walked past her at reception on their way out of the office, so it couldn't be her, and none of the other female goblins in the building had ever shown that sort of interest in him. Besides, a moment later, presumably without realising she was doing it, Sophie started cleaning out her ear with the tip of her index finger, and that was so definitively Sophie that it had to be her. In which case, don't go there, Paul warned himself, and for once he had the good sense to listen to his own advice. A wise man once said that in central London there are only two sorts of pedestrian, the quick and the dead. Having got out of the taxi on the south side of Birdcage Walk, they managed to sprint through a gap in the lava floor of traffic into the wrapper-strewn piece of the park and soon found themselves at the edge of the water, surrounded on all sides by a seething carpet of docks. Well, Paul said, here goes. Good luck. He held out the bird seed bag and Sophie gravely scooped up a handful. The ancient Romans reckoned they could predict the future by watching birds, Sophie said, after a few distributions of largesse. Maybe that's what this is all about. Interesting theory, Paul replied, in his best Hugh Grant voice. You mean, if they climb on each other's backs and try to peck each other's eyes out, it means that there's going to be a general election? (laughs) A strange moment. At first, Sophie started to frown, as she generally did just before she treated a feeble jock with the contempt she felt it deserved. But then she sort of froze for a heartbeat, and then she giggled. 
Sophie didn't often giggle in the same way that deep pools of water rarely set on fire by stray sparks. <laughs> Something like that, she said. Or if they all waddle about frantically with their bottoms in the air, it means... Paul, who'd been watching a fat brown duck with limp, waited for her to finish the sentence, but she didn't. He looked round, but she wasn't there any more. He swivelled his head round like a tank turret. She couldn't have gone far, and they were at the edge of the pond, but he still couldn't see her. Then he turned back and nearly fell over. Where Sophie had been standing was a goblin, in broad daylight, all fangs and claws and round red eyes, and its outstretched paw were a few grains of millet.'